don't have to really, you know, talk long about the impact that SARS-CoV-2 or better known as COVID-19 has had on our daily lives. It has affected everybody. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a green milestone that we are very close to 6 million deaths worldwide and that COVID has, you know, impacted a lot of different areas, as you can see on this slide. Now, if there is uh, a few silver linings, uh, this is one of them, okay? It has really brought about this uh, new technology to treat uh, or, or, or to uh, create vaccines uh, that can prevent uh, severe uh, uh, cases of COVID. And, and I think most of you know how mRNA vaccine works, right? So mRNA vaccine uh, gets injected into our body. Our cell is tricked to produce, or you know, it's programmed to produce protein in this case, spike proteins, which then uh, uh, programs the uh, 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 immune cells to create antibodies that can now be used to neutralize uh, the, the actual viruses when they enter our body. Now, I think most of you here know this, but for those of you in, in Grenoble, one of the key technologies and advances that enabled uh, uh, these vaccine was actually developed right here at Penn by uh, these two scientists that you see here, Drew Weisman and, and Kat Kathleen, uh, Kat Kat Katalinko. Um, and, and the reason that I said that this is one of the few silver linings is that people believe that mRNA will, will now be the future of biomedicine, okay? It's not just going to be vaccine, but it's going to be used to treat disease so forth. So here, what you see is a number of uh, examples of mRNA-based uh, therapies that are being developed. And as you can see, there's a, a huge activities in the field of oncology to treat uh, uh, cancer. And I, I believe uh, last week, uh, Moderna was able to start their phase one clinical trial for HIV vaccine as well, based on mRNA technology. So, so again, you know, there's nothing really well, there are very few things that were good about pandemic, but this pandemic has brought about and, and really at a, at a, a breakneck speed, uh, uh, this, this mRNA technologies. Now, uh, despite the fact that mRNA is an awesome, awesome, you know, uh, uh, therapeutic uh, for, for future application, there are still some drawbacks, okay? And, and I list some of them here. When mRNA vaccine was first being distributed, we all heard about this need for cryogenic storage and transportation, right? mRNA vaccine or mRNA therapeutics are intrinsically very, very unstable. Uh, also, what people want to do is they want to create uh, mRNAs that are either very specific to certain cells or tissues or that are broadly applicable, okay? And this, uh, we still don't have control over. And then there's this, you know, um, uh, manufacturing bottleneck. Right now, the way, way mRNA vaccine is produced is it's uh, produced centrally. And what's really needed is uh, there's really need to establish RNA uh, as a deployable, okay, highly deployable uh, technology to uh, treat disease or produce vaccine. Uh, one easy way to think about is to think about this building, Sync Center, okay? We don't have to go to TMSC or Samsung to do that. Right? By having these distributed fabrication facilities, it democratizes the technology. So in the case of non-emergency, we as researchers can take advantage of the facilities to create what we need to make advances in science. However, in the case of emergency, what these distributed manufacturing facilities can do is that they can coordinate and create vaccines and drugs that can meet the demand. Uh, when, when there's, you know, for example, outbreak locally. So that's the idea. Um, so let me just go through some of these ideas. So when vaccine is made, they're, they're encapsulated in these things called lipid nanoparticles. And as you can see, it's made out of these four components. And to, for these lipid nanoparticles to be very effective, you have to make sure that these four components are optimized so they, they can be delivered. And this process obviously takes a long time to optimize. So uh, uh, in collaboration with, with, with Mike Mitchell and Drew Weissman, what we are doing is we are barcoding LMPs with different formulations. These barcoded 
lipid nanoparticles are pulled and they're injected into animal. And then, and then the animal is sacrificed to see where these different types of lipid nanoparticles end up, giving us way to test uh, the, the distribution of lipid nanoparticles in vivo. So that's going to uh, allow us to create and design new LMPs that will be used to enable either very specific or broadly applicable LMPs. Um, one challenge that I told you about uh, the vaccine fabrication is that they are done centrally. In this case, I'm showing you uh, how mRNAs are produced right now. And what's really remarkable is that mRNA is produced by technologies that are very, very complex and that requires you know, a, a lot of coordination of these you know, uh, units. And then once mRNA is produced, it's shipped from Andover, in this case, Massachusetts, to Kalamazoo, Michigan, where the Pfizer facility is, okay? So what we wanna do is instead of applying on such you know, uh, uh, centralized uh, facilities, we wanna create these small scale, highly deployable and modular uh, mRNA manufacturing facilities based on uh, this intensified process where we create mRNA and purify or, or isolate mRNA based on these biphasing material or, or known as bigel. And, and uh, uh, we have uh, several people that are working on this project. And the last part of mRNA um, vaccine fabrication is getting mRNA into those LMPs, okay? And this is currently done using this jet impinging technology that you see here. And, and this is a straight quote from New York Times that really gives a beautiful sort of account of how mRNA vaccines are made. And what you'll see is that although this technology that is being used right now is not ideal, they just have to work with it because they were in a hurry. What they really want is a precision mixing devices. And in collaboration with this uh, startup, and I have to declare a conflict of interest here, what we are trying to do is we are trying to uh, um, uh, paralyze these uh, precise mixing devices in the form of microfluidics using uh, our fab facilities. So here, what I'm showing you is a four inch device where we can now produce precisely controlled LMPs at the scale that the industry is requiring right now. And as you can see, this is a small four inch wafer that fits on the palm of your hand and it can produce tens of liters of vaccines uh, uh, in a day. So, what we are doing now is we have all these three parts that are working together. Ultimately, what we want to do is we want to be able to have this in, uh, integrator process where we take the LMPs that have been optimized using this uh, pulled barcoded approach and create mRNA using this intensified process and, and then encapsulate them using these uh, microfluidic technology. And in order to make this dream come true, we need the dream team, right? So this is the dream that, that, that we put together. Uh, we have Drew Weissman, Mike Mitchell that is working on LMP design. Uh, there are people from Colorado, Oklahoma, Drexel University, as well as uh, myself and Case Debbie here at Penn that are focusing on RNA manufacturing. And then we also have a, a startup, a new startup that is working on LMP manufacturing. And we've been very fortunate to get the major funding from Welcome Leap uh, as well as NSF. So um, I hope that uh, this is just getting started, but I hope that in two or three years, we'll be able to give you some updates on the actual science. Thanks very much.